makers of Campbell Soup present the Campbell Playhouse. Orson Welles, producer. pictures and even the radio and the living stage have made it clear by now that the female of the species is not only more deadly than the opposite sex, more desirable but also more durable in times of stress and more to be relied on for the solution of even the bloodiest murder. And in case these observations may seem as irrelevant as they are certainly irreverent, let me break down right here and admit the subject of tonight's broadcast is the bloodiest of bloody murders. Now, as to the ladies. Time was when all the girls used to do in a mystery story was to scream, scream loudly, and be grasped at by horrible, uh, clutching claws. But all that's been changed. And the heroines of these modern romances are ladies of parts. They are not the ones to find themselves clad only in something filmy and feminine, being carried off by a gorilla whose identity you will be subsequently requested not to divulge. They are not susceptible to hypnosis, to the blandishments of sinister Latins, and they never faint. They are accomplished in the use of firearms and can escape from anything, including suspicion. But the gentlemen, I am sorry to say, have degenerated in our new fiction into a pretty pathetic low among human things. There seems to be no excuse for us. I say us because tonight I am fated to attempt before this microphone the portrayal of one of these wretched beings. No, the lady bloodhounds could do without us if they didn't still insist just for appearances on the old traditional turnout of likely suspects. There's always a woman which is tonight's story contains no less than two murders and Miss Mary Wilson. Miss Wilson is one of the most promising of the talented and personable young women whom Hollywood has discovered in recent days. Her frequent appearance as what is called a dumb and dizzy blonde is, let it be noted, an outstanding example of what is known to the entertainment world as casting against type. In There's Always a Woman, Miss Wilson demonstrates again that dumbness and dizziness can be surface disguises of infinite resources and a far-seeing purpose. But before our story of the evening, Mr. Ernest Chappell has a question to ask us, the answer to which I'm pretty sure will be unanimous. Mr. Chappell? Thank you, Orson Welles. And ladies and gentlemen, the question is simply this. What one soup would you say most deserves to be called a family standby? As Orson Welles suggested, I'm pretty sure of your answer. Isn't it vegetable soup? Bowls of homemade vegetable soup, I imagine, are among the very earliest memories of nearly all of us. Maybe we also recall the time and trouble Mother took to make that soup, simmering the stock and preparing the vegetables. Yet, as Mother's will... She always felt rewarded when she saw how much the family enjoyed it. Today, most of us still have a keen liking for vegetable soup. But wives and mothers increasingly are giving up making it and instead are serving Campbell's vegetable soup. Are you at your house? Of course, it will save much kitchen time and trouble. But a far more important reason is that one taste of Campbell's will convince you that it's made in the time-honored good home way. Grown-ups and children alike enjoy the 15 different garden vegetables and the rich beef stock that together make Campbell's vegetable soup so stout and hearty and nourishing. You'll realize why women everywhere agree that it's almost a meal in itself. Wouldn't piping hot bowls of Campbell's vegetable soup just hit the spot with everyone at your house tomorrow? And now Orson Welles in There's Always a Woman with Marie Wilson. for three months' rent. You $375. Unless this bill is paid in on before the first, the undersigned reserved the right to re-rent the premises. Signed, Frank F. Carter. Oh, Bill, what are we going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get my old job back. 
Hello? Is this the uh, district attorney's office? Oh, district no, attorney Bill, there? No. Shut up. This is uh, Bill uh, Reardon. Now, oh, hello, Joe. Why will he be in? Half an hour? Thanks. Oh, Bill, where's your prize? I just swallowed it. It's the only thing you can swallow on credit. Come on, Sally, we'll go down and see the DA together. You can make up your mind your husband is just too dumb to make a go of this detective business. Uh, not me. I'm going to carry on here. All right, you carry on, but make sure to get out of here by the first of the month, unless you want Mr. Carter to re-rent you, too. Well, I hope you don't get the job. If I don't, there's a cute little bench in Central Park where we can spend the summer. Oh, Bill. And don't be too sure of that bench. It's first come, first served in Central Park. <laughs> Pardon me, is Mr. Reardon in? No. Well, could you tell me when he'll be in? I want to see him on business. A uh, business? Uh, uh, well, uh, won't you sit down? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reardon is out right now on a very important case, but if there's anything that's... Uh, say, uh, uh, could I have him call you? I prefer not to give my name. Well, just as you wish, Mrs. Frazier. How did you know my name is Frazier? Well, your picture was in the papers when you were married, and it's a detective's business ever to forget a face. Are you a detective? I'm Mr. Reardon's chief operator. I handle all his women clients. You see, women often feel that they can talk more freely to another woman. And you keep this matter confidential. I won't even discuss it with Mr. Reardon. But you have to know, won't you? Well, not unless you want him to. You see, you'll be entered in our books as a number. Uh, Now, just a moment. Let's see. The last case was, let me see, number 375. Your case will be number 376. And now then, what can I do for you? Well, there's a person I'd like to have shadowed. Her name is Calhoun, Anne Calhoun. Here's her picture. Oh, thanks. Gee, nice looking, isn't she? Uh, To Lola, who is doing a much better job than I would have done, Anne. Hmm. Is this inscription anything to do with the case? Anne Calhoun was engaged to my husband before I... Before... Oh, uh, I understand. Well, there hasn't been anything to understand until a week ago. Then quite suddenly, Mr. Fraser began getting letters and phone calls from her. I haven't spied, but I, I know her handwriting and I know her voice. There's something going on between them, and you've got to find out. If I don't solve it by the first of the month, Mrs. Fraser, I'll retire from business. I'll just leave this office. Uh, by the I... way, if you want to get a good look at her, at Miss Calhoun, she and my husband and I and Jerry Marlowe are dropping in at the Skyline Club tonight. A uh, Skyline Club? Oh, well, I'll be there. Now, I dare say you want some advance money for expenses. Uh, I dare say. I don't know what your rates are, Miss, but... Uh, how would $300 do? $300? Why? I'm sorry. It's all I happen to have with me. Of course, if you insist. Oh, I... no, no. That's all right. It's... Of course, it's less than our usual rates, but I'm delighted to make the exception. Oh, thank you, Miss... Um, uh... Operator 7. Just call me that. Goodbye, 376. We're the detective agency, Operator 7. Who's that? You sound awfully happy. Oh, I am. I got my job back. Let's celebrate. What's the salary? I said celebrate. What do you get paid? $75 each and every week. Oh, isn't that nice? Hey, what's wrong? Oh, I said, isn't that nice? Say, what did you say about celebrating? Let's start packing. But what's the hurry? We got until the first. Okay, if you don't mind being lonesome. Tell me, how's the Reardon agency coming along under its new management? Uh, splendidly, thank you. Splendidly. Customers are popping in all over the place. Customers? Name one. The Reardon Detective Agency never reveals the name of its clients. That's part of the Reardon policy. That's an easy policy. Mm-hmm. There aren't any Reardon clients. Any more bills come in? Uh, several. Uh, three great big ones. Say, didn't you say something about celebrating? Sure. Where you meet me? Well, how about the Skyline Club, Bill? We can afford it, can't we? No, we can't afford the Skyline oh, Club. Oh, just this one. It's always just this one. Oh, Bill, I just love the Skyline Club. Sally, we can't afford the Skyline Club. <laughs> Love the Skyline Club, don't you, Bill? Well, don't you, Bill? No, it's too expensive, but it is pretty, and this man wants to take your order. He's not waiting to ask you to dance. Oh, oh excuse me. Let's see. After the puree mango, uh, um, I think I'll take the filet mignon. Next name. You mean instead of filet mignon? No, I'd really rather have the filet mignon. And some sliced tomatoes. Sliced tomatoes, yes, madame. And some potato salad. And some potato, sa- potato salad. Uh, I'm very far from How about uh, that, dear? Oh, yeah, and some coffee. Uh, does strawberries go with my tea? Madame will find out. Too sweet, madame. And you, monsieur, will read A small them? glass of water and a hard roll. Toasted? If you insist. With a regular dinner, sir? If you insist. Any wine, sir? No, thanks, sir. I mean, no. Now, wait a minute. I might want some. Why don't you ask No me? wine, waiter, and make it quick. You're very good, monsieur. Scruples? No, just mathematics. All I have is a $20 bill. Uh, you don't by any chance have a couple of dollars in your purse. Money? Well, why didn't you 
say so. Now, let's see. I've got, uh, got a half a dollar and four pennies and three sticks of chewing gum. Give me and... the half a dollar. You can keep the chewing gum. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Shane. Uh, Hello, Mr. Reardon. Just the man I want to see, Mr. Shane. Will you uh, cash a check for me, Mr. Why, Shane? Sure. Uh, How much do you want? Not much. Uh, Twenty-five bucks. I'd better make it fifty in case you want some uh, champagne. That's all. It's, champ- uh, it's uh, Mrs. Reardon, Mr. Shane. Oh. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Shane? Nice to meet you, Mrs. Reardon. My wife. Uh, Here's your 50. Thanks. Got a pen? I'll write you a check. Here you are. Oh, you're taking an awful chance, Mr. Shane. <laughs> uh, I don't think he's got $50 in his account. Yeah. Well, I'm sort of used to taking chances. <laughs> your wife has a great sense of humor, Mr. Reardon. Have you noticed it, too? Here's your check. Thanks. Haven't seen you around lately, Mr. Reardon. No, I've been busy. How do you like being on your own? I'm not exactly on my own anymore. I'm back with the DA. Oh, that reminds me. You don't happen to have his home phone number, do you? Well, you did me a favor. Lexington 8672, and he won't be home till pretty late. Lexington 8672. Thank you. Oh, uh, don't tell him where you got it. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Shane. The captain told me to tell you there's a call for you in the office. Yeah, you excuse me, folks? Oh, certainly, Mr. I'll Shane. probably see you around later. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. Bye. Nice personality. Yes, uh, most gamblers have. Gambler? I thought you said he owned this place. Well, he also happens to own the casino across the river. Oh, uh, why couldn't I have married a man like that? Instead of a prohibitionist. Say, I'll bet he could have got us a better table than this one, too. We're lucky to have a table at all. Do you remember way back, Sally, on the phone when you promised if I brought you to the Skyline Club, you'd go light on everything? But that was before you made the $50. What $50? The $50 you just got from Mr. Shane. Oh, excuse me. I forgot uh-huh. about that. Of course, there's always a chance that he might deposit that check. Well, even if he does, you still have $50 more than when you started out. And that's certainly a profit. Certainly is. Mm-hmm. But do me a favor, will you, Sally? And don't mention it to the income tax people. They don't understand finance as well as you do. You know you can trust me, Bill. Sure. Eat your soup. It's not soup. It's puree mongo. Try not to eat so noisily, even if you had a couple of martinis. That's quality folks. The next table. Oh, pew. That's not call- quality folk either. I'll bet they're just as unimportant as you and I. For your information, Mrs. Reardon, they are people that any pre- one pretending to be a detective ought to know at first sight. They're Mr. and Mrs. Fraser. Faber? Fra- uh... F R A S E R. Oh, I get it, Fraser. I get it. <laughs> this other man is Jerry Marlowe, transcontinental copper, and the girl's Ann Calhoun. You know Ann Calhoun? You engaged her. You're just girl. showing off again, Bill Reardon. I don't think you know anything about them. Oh, be quiet. Them. Not so loud, Sally, please. I'm not talking half as loud as they are. No. Why don't you listen? Listen, Jerry, I just thought it was dead to Walter. Didn't I, Walter? Certainly didn't. Say, who's engaged to Ann, anyhow? Don't be jealous, Jerry. If you two think you're going to put anything over Jerry, Turn around. They'll notice you're staring at them, oh. Sally. I'll bet they love it. Oh, Why, Sally. if I was a society, I'd want everybody to stare at me all the time. I wonder if you'd answer me one question. What question? How did a smart guy like me happen to marry a dumb cluck like you? Oh, I don't know. I don't think there's any explanation. No, probably it's not. One of those things, yeah. you know. Okay, you know, this silly mignon is delicious. It's, it's delicious. Glad you enjoy it. Uh, aren't eating your lamb Not shop. hungry. Uh-huh. Well, you paid for it. Don't be extra. I don't want anything more to eat. Waiter, bring me something to drink. Champagne. One glass. Yes, but one madame. glass. Two glasses, waiter. Oh, yes, madame. Had more than enough to drink, Sally. Not well, I can still spell Mississippi. M-I-S-I-P-I. Correct? It's as close as you'll ever get. <laughs> Let's go back to the table. Uh, shh, quiet, Bill. What is it now? We're going to get another chance to learn how to talk when oh, we get into society. Sit there and just listen in on a lot <laughs> well, of people. Well, can I help it if I want to be closer like Mr. and Mrs. Frazier oh, sh- and Miss Calhoun? Sh- now, quiet. This is for when I've been dancing with somebody else's <laughs> husband. <laughs> Stop. Well, it wouldn't be the first time he lost you, Anne. What do you mean by that, Jerry? Oh, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Anne's engaged to me now, and I'll kill the first guy that tries to take her away from her. Bravo! Bravo! That's your spirit. Oh, just a minute, Sally. madam. Our conversation is no concern of yours. I know, but you were expressing yourself so beautifully, I couldn't help but listen in. Sally, will you please shut <laughs> up, Sally, If I darling. knew this gentleman's name, I'd be glad to... Listen here, you. young lady. Bill, yes, but you I'm don't... Walter, let's pay the check and go. Oh, you think Mr. Frazier means I check, too? Sally, you better shut up. What, do you think so? Come on, let's go. Uh, look, mister, would you like me to shut Ellie, up? coming. Yes, I'm coming. See, Bill, you were wrong. They won't even answer me. You're lucky. Wait up. Uh, yes, Mr. Reardon. You can give Mrs. Reardon the check, please. <laughs> that Walter Frazier was shot. Shot dead in Jerry Marlowe's apartment. Uh, just a minute. I'll give you the city desk. Okay. Good morning, city desk. Oh, can you tell me if it's true about Walter Frazier? Madam, are you kidding? Well, it's here in the headlines. It says Frazier was shot in Jerry Marlowe's apartment. You think we put it in to improve circulation? What do you want, madam? Well, I wonder if I could interest you in the Frazier murder. Why? Did you kill him? No, but I think I know who did. I'm Sally Reardon of the Reardon Detective Agency. You know... No, I don't know, but go ahead. 
Well, if you don't want to know about a threat that Marlowe made, I can call the Globe. You know, there's more than one paper in New York. Yes, okay, okay. We'll send somebody over. What's the address? Now, take it easy, Marlowe. I don't want to take it easy. And you're a fine lawyer, I must say. Take it easy. Can't you read? Marlowe guilty, says blonde investigator. Why should I hire anybody who says that? To make a stop say that. That's bribery, Mr. Ketterling. I don't want any part of it. You made the threat, didn't you? Yes, yes, I made the threat, but I didn't kill him. That's important, too. Not as important as you think. The important thing is to make sure you're not convicted. Mrs. Reardon is here, Mr. Ketterling. Good. Send her right in. And you'll be nice to her, Jerry. Nice to her, nice to her. I'd like to kill her. You keep on talking about liking to kill people, and you'll be a suspect in every murder trial in New York. This way, Mrs. Reardon. Oh, how, how do you do, Mrs. Reardon? Oh, are you Mr. Ketterling? You know Mr. Marlowe, don't you? Oh, well, we met last night, didn't How we? Do you I mean, well, maybe we didn't meet, but we spoke. Well, Mrs. Reardon, I've explained to Mr. Marlowe that you've agreed to do some investigating for us. Well, you understand, Mr. Marlowe, we're very busy down at the office just now, but this was such an interesting case, I felt I couldn't afford to turn it down. That's very generous of you, Mrs. Reardon. Don't you think so, Jerry? Yes, very generous, very generous. Uh, yes, Mr. Ketterling and I agreed upon 200 and a week in expenses, didn't we, Mr. Ketterling? That's right, and here's your check, Mrs. Reardon. Wait a minute. Mrs. Reardon, how are you going to fix that newspaper story? Oh, that. <laughs> Excuse me for waving this check in your face, Mr. Marlowe, but I want the ink to dry. Hello? Daily Bulletin. Uh, give me the city desk. City desk. Good morning. Uh, hello, this is Mrs. Reardon. Uh-huh. Uh, I've got a new story for you. <laughs> got your pencil ready? Ready. All right. A Marlowe innocent, innocent, says blonde investigator. Make up your mind, lady. Well, well I, I know I said he was guilty, but just this minute I picked up some new evidence. And I hope it doesn't bounce. Hello, Bill. Are you home? I'm home. Why would you repeat that crack of Marlowe's to reporters? Which crack? When a man threatens to kill a rival in the nightclub, you know he's not going to do it. Why did you repeat it to the reporters? Oh, I, I didn't repeat anything. I just happened to be talking to the Daily Bulletin in one way or another. I Sally Reardon, you to tell me the truth or so help me, I'll kill you. Everybody wants to kill somebody lately. Have you noticed? Sally. Well, I told him I was going to get some publicity, or I, rather I told publicity. you I was going to get publicity. And, well, after all, Marlowe did say But it. he was drunk, and I'm supposed to be working for the district attorney, not trying cases in the newspapers. Oh, gee, I didn't mean to do anything wrong, Sally, Bill. Sally, I appreciate what you're trying to do, but I've told you before, it's the man's place to make the money for the home, and it's the woman's place to take care of the man when he comes home, Sally. Oh, Bill, you're perfectly right. And to prove it, I'm going into the kitchen right now, and I'm going to get you the best supper you ever had. How do you want your coffee? Weak or strong? Strong. I've got things to do tonight. What things? I thought you were going into the kitchen. But, Bill, why should take an interest in what her husband is doing, don't you think? No. Uh, are you and the D.A. going to arrest anybody tonight? No, but I'll tell you who the D.A. would uh, like to arrest. Who? You. Mr. Marlowe, you're not going to get anywhere by trying to oppose us. What the D.A. wants is the truth. If you're smart, you'll cooperate with us. You'll all cooperate with us. Good morning, Mr. Evans. Mrs. Fraser, you know District Attorney, Mr. Evans, I think. How uh, do you do, Mrs. Fraser? We're sorry, of course, trouble you at a time like this, but Anything it can't be helped. I can do it. Okay. We want to know exactly where in this apartment each person was when the shot was fired. How about you, Miss Calhoun? I was in the kitchen mixing a drink. And where was Mr. Fraser? I don't know. I, I, I'm sure he was in the living room. Is it true that you were once engaged to Mr. Fraser, Miss Calhoun? Yes, I was. And now you're engaged to Mr. Marlowe? Yes, I am. And what of it? Nothing, Mr. Marlowe. Only I may have to dig into some of these relationships. You're just going to make a lot all. of talk. That'll do you. Where were you, Mrs. Fraser, when the shot was fired? I was in the library. I was reaching for the phone. Where were you, Marlowe? Well, to tell the truth, I'd had a couple of drinks. I couldn't swear where I was. Well, Jerry, you were in the kitchen with me. But Jerry, I thought... Yes, Mrs. Fraser? Oh, nothing. You were about to say something. But Jerry had just walked me through the living room to show me where the phone was. The shot came almost immediately, and I, I didn't think he had time to get back to the kitchen. He had just come back when the shot was fired. Well, what about it, Marlowe? I told you I don't remember. Nobody seems to remember much anything about this affair. I beg your pardon, what is it, Mr. officer? Could you, could you come out in the hall for sure, a while? Sure, I'll be right back. Excuse me, folks. Well, Fogarty, what is this? There's a crazy dame been trying to get in here. I told her she couldn't. She told me to memorize this message and to give it to you. Memorize it, message? Dearest darling, don't forget the butler, Sally. She said you were dearest darling. And you'd know who she was. I know who she was. No answer. Go back to your post. Hey, you there. Come back here. You the butler? Yes, sir. What's your name? Grigson, sir. Where were you last night, uh, Grigson, when Mrs., uh, rather, Mr. Fraser was murdered? Oh, I was asleep, sir. The shot waked me. 
I put on a bathrobe and I came down. How long have you worked for Mr. Marlowe? I engaged him in London two years ago. Nothing wrong with your memory now, Mr. Marlowe, is there? Well, you better start remembering some recent tonight. I want to take a look at your pantry, Gregson. Yes, sir. Come on. I'm in a search this apartment. We haven't been able to visit it, Gregson. Oh, I don't know, sir. You haven't seen it, have you? No, sir. Get away from that door. What are you trying to do? Conceal something in that ice box? No, I wasn't trying to conceal anything. I'll take a look I... anyway. It's all right. Wait a minute. That's a funny place for an ice cube tray. Well, I I, I didn't have time to put it back in the right place. I'll just take I... a look at it. Well, what have you got to say now? Well, I, I don't think I understand. It's not so hard to understand. There's a gun frozen into that tray. That's all. Why, well, I never saw it before. Well, listen, what have you found? Nothing much. Just this gun. Where was it? In the ice cube tray. How do you cover that, Gregson? I, I don't know, sir. Ever handle a gun? No, sir. Here, take all of this gun of mine. Don't get scared. I'm taking the cartridges off. Yes, sir. You say you never shot a gun? No, sir. Well, here's your first lesson. Shoot this. Oh, no, sir. I, I couldn't. I wouldn't know how. Just sir. pull the trigger. Give me that gun. Yes, sir. You never shot a gun before? No, sir. You knew enough to release the safety catch before you pulled the trigger. Fogarty, yes, take him downtown. You can't do that. Marlow. You were told to stay in the other Are room. Are you trying to hang this on Gregson? Want to go along, Mr. Marlow? You bet I can. Fine. Maybe they can help you to remember down there where you were last yes, night. Yes, and I warn you, if any attempt is made to pull the safety Come on, come on. on. Just a minute, Bill. Yeah? Whatever made you suspect the button? Oh, just instinct. You know how it is. You get a hunch. Just one of those things. Sorry, Miss. Mr. Turner's busy. Well, will you please tell him that Mrs. Reardon is here? I'm sorry, you'll have to wait. Do you have a chair, please? Why, how do you do, Mrs. Reardon? Oh, Mr. Shane, fancy meeting you here. Uh, can I sit next to you? I wish you would. Tell me, Mr. Shane, what is a high-class restaurant owner doing in the district attorney's office, if I may ask? Oh, I get around. Say, I hope you aren't here to complain about my husband's chair. <laughs> no, that hasn't bounced yet. What might you be doing in the district attorney's office, if I may ask, Mrs. Reardon? Some new clues on the Fraser murder? How did you know? Oh, I've been following you. You've been following me? In the papers. Oh. As I understand it, you no longer think Jerry Marlowe is guilty. Oh, no. That first story I gave out was just a red herring. Suspect the butler? Oh, no, it's never the butler. When you've read as many... I mean, when you've handled as many detective cases as I have, you know it's never the butler. Oh, they always look guilty, but it turns out they never are. They found the gun on him. Oh, they always do. That's just to throw you off the track. Now, uh, no, there's just one clue that may be worth... Mr. Shane, maybe you can help me. I'd appreciate the opportunity. I uh, guess what was in that envelope that Ann Calhoun gave you the other night. Envelope that Ann Calhoun gave me? The night I was in the Skyline Club with my husband. I don't know what you're talking oh, about. Shane. Yeah, hello, Mr. Evans. Shane, I'm sorry, but I won't have time to see well, you. When I called you the other night, you said to be sure and drop yes, in. Yes, I know, I know, but that was before this Fraser case turned up. Uh, come in and see me next week sometime. All right, I... I'll call you when I'm ready for you. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Redden. Uh-huh. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. Think it over. Oh, could I have a moment, please, Miss Evans? I must talk to you. I have some very important clues. I've been reading all about your clues. Oh, but but, but this is a new one. Yes, tell them to your husband. Maybe he'll listen to you. Oh, no, you see, he isn't speaking to me these days. Yeah, smart fellow, Redden. You know, Mr. Evans, I think he's mixed up in this case. Who, your husband? No, Mr. Shane. As it happens, I was talking to Shane over the telephone just about the time the murder was committed. What do you think he was doing? Holding the receiver in one hand, the revolver in the other. Maybe the ventriloquist. Look, Mrs. Reardon, I have great sympathy with your husband. Greater now than with any man I have ever met. And if you don't stop well, butting into this case... I trying to help, sir, the ends of justice. The ends of justice have gotten along very well now until without you. So will you please go away? All right. got any sense at all, you'll stop pretending you're dumb. We've been here for three hours talking to you, and we're prepared to stay for 30. It's up to you. I don't know anything, Mr. How did Redden. that gun get into your pantry, Gregson? I don't know. How did that gun happen to have your fingerprints? I don't know. You can't pin this on thing on me. On the second of this month, you went to a pawn shop located at 374 Hillcrest Drive, Newark. No. You bought a revolver there for $15. No, I the didn't. Pawn brokers identified you from your photograph. I don't Before believe you it. bought the revolver, Gregson, you examined several rifles. No, I didn't. He tried to show I me a rifle. I thought you'd walk into that, Gregson. Well, well I, I bought the gun for Mr. Marlowe. Marlowe sent you to a pawn shop. No. He gave me $20 to go and he buy a gun. He gave you $20 to buy a gun, and you bought one for $15. Chiseled him out of $5. Well, I hid the gun for him. Oh, well, you did hide the gun. Oh, after I bought the gun, Mr. Marlowe kept it in a drawer in his room. About a week ago, the gun was missing. Did you speak to Marlowe about it? No, I didn't think it was any of my business. Go on. Well, when the shot was fired, I put on my bathrobe, and I rushed down. Roger's body was lying on the floor. A woman was screaming. Yes, Mr. tell Marlow. us about that. Tell us about Mr. Marlowe. Well, he, he was trying to quiet the ladies. Mrs. Fraser and Miss Calhoun. I saw a gun lying by the French window. The gun you bought at the pawn shop? Yes. I picked it up and I slipped it in my bathrobe and I hid it in the pantry. Marlowe told you to hide it? No. What did he say when you told him where it was? I didn't tell you him. You expect us to believe that? I don't care what you believe. It's the truth. Mr. Marlowe, I read you the statement we got from Grigson. What have you got to say about it? All right. All right. I did have Grigson buy a gun. What of it? 
The gun disappeared about a week. The gun just walked out of your desk. I don't know what happened to it. Did you ask Gregson about it? No. And when I saw it was missing, I was glad. Why were you glad, Mr. Marlowe? I was afraid I might use it on Fraser. You bought it to use on Fraser, didn't you? Yes. Why? Because he was up to something with Anne. With Miss Calhoun, I mean. She's been worried to death about something, and she'd been writing. How do you know she was writing to him? I was with him in his apartment one day when a maid brought his mail in. I know Anne's handwriting. He didn't open the letter. He just looked confused and slipped it into his pocket. Any idea what it was all about? No, she denied everything, and he lied. I was going crazy. I'd have killed him all right. I'm sorry I didn't. Cheer up, Marlowe. Maybe we can prove you did. Listening to Orson Welles and the Campbell Playhouse presentation of There's Always a Woman with Marie Wilson. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Chapel, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we shall resume our presentation of There's Always a Woman. But first, as we all realize, in a very few days now, the Christmas holidays will be upon us. And with the children home for vacation, we usher in the happiest and the busiest season of the year. Perhaps the busiest person of all in every home will be mother. There will be entertaining, dinners to be given, gay parties for the young people, possibly relatives staying over... And the task of planning, preparing, and carrying through this round of Yuletide activities will, of course, fall mainly upon Mother as the heart and center of the home. Among these tasks of hers, none will loom larger, probably, than the planning of meals. And so I'd like to remind every mother listening tonight of the part that well-chosen soups can play in holiday menus. Apart from the wholesome nourishment you know good soup provides for everyone, not forgetting the children... You'll be delighted to see how the serving of a tempting soup can dress up even your simplest meal. Give it a really festive touch. During the holidays just ahead, I'm sure you'll want to serve Campbell's soups often for their fine home-like flavor and for the real help they can give you in meal planning these busy days. And now Orson Welles resumes our Campbell Playhouse presentation of There's Always a Woman with Marie Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chappell, and we'll proceed in just a minute. But before we do... Who killed Walter Fraser? Uh, did uh, you do it, Mr. Wells? Well, that isn't fair. I'm the detective, but uh, you never know. Uh, how about uh, Marie Wilson? Sally? Mr. Chappell, you're speaking of my wife, but she knows more than she's telling, or she's telling more than she knows. Why, Bill, I never knew you cared. In fact, I think there's less to Miss Wilson than meets the eye. Well, how about me? Who are you? You know perfectly well, Orson Welles. I'm Ray Collins, heavily disguised as Nicky Shane, a gambler, and I'd like to know what Grigson the butler was doing with Marlowe's revolver in the ice cube tray. Everett Sloan, you're playing Grigson. Now, just a minute, Ray. I must warn you, Everett Sloan, that anything you say will be held against Grigson. Well, I don't want to name any names, but the gun belongs to Edgar Barrier, who's playing Marlowe. Yes, but I don't keep my guns on ice. Shall we suspect the ladies? You can't bound us. That was Mary Taylor and Georgia Bacchus in the order of their appearance. Mary Taylor plays Lola, the first client of the Reardon Detective Agency, the wife of the murdered man. And uh, George Abacus plays Anne Calhoun, who was engaged to the murdered man and who is now, interestingly enough, engaged to Mr. Marlowe. I object. This is irrelevant. Name, please? Frank Reddick. Never mind the billing, Frank. Okay, I'm playing your boss, the district attorney, and I'll thank you to get on with the case. Remember, please, that a murder has been committed. That's right. There's another member in the cast, Mr. Richard Wilson. I'm sorry, Mr. Wells. I'm Walter Frazier. I can't step out of character. I'm dead. I think this has gone far enough. Hello? Uh, Mr. Ketterling, please. Oh, hello, Mr. Ketterling. 
Oh, I've marvelous news for you. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I tried to get you earlier, and then later I was out myself shopping. Uh huh. I just get in, got in this minute. Huh? Uh, the good news? Well, it's not exactly good. I mean, well, it looks pretty bad for our client, poor Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> yes, but don't you worry. I have a plan if I can get rid of my husband. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm starting out at 8 o'clock, and. No, I can't tell you yet. Hmm? Well, because I'm not quite sure what the plan is. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Catterling. All right, you dirty little double-crosser. You heard the phone call? I heard part of it. I wasn't interested much. Oh, you weren't interested much. No, after a man has discovered his wife is double-crossing him, nothing she can say can interest him. And besides, the man at headquarters is listening in and taking down the full conversation. You mean these wires are tapped? In a way. Then you know everything? No, I'm not that good, but I do know that Ketterling and Marlowe have hired you. How did you find that out? I'm the smartest detective in town. You told me so yourself once. Of course, that was before you thought you were the smartest detective in town. Anyhow, I got some clients. Yes, you got one client, a potential murderer. Is that so? To me, the most convincing proof that Marlowe was guilty is that he hired you. Only a desperate man would do that. But he's not guilty. That's your story, and you're being paid to think it. He had his man buy a gun in order to kill Frazier, and Frazier was killed. That adds up, doesn't it? No, it doesn't add up. The gun was stolen from him a week ago. Can you prove that? No. But I'm going you to. You haven't got a chance. Well, if I do, will you admit that I'm a better, uh, better man than you are or am? Well, anyway, just as good. You bet. I know when I'm licked. Well, I must be running along. I suppose I ought to warn you that wherever you go tonight, you'll probably be shadowed by one of my men. Oh, that's not fair, Bill. All fair in love and war. Hey, this is, this is war in a way, isn't it? Mm, but it's love, too, I guess, or I'd have divorced you long ago. So long, dear. Oh, so long, though, as a matter of fact, I'm going out, too. Oh, Bill. Yeah? Doesn't this remind you of the Civil War stories, you know, where the northern uh, uh, captain falls in love with the beautiful southern spy? Yeah, a little. Oh, and uh, when you get back home, if you're not too tired, dear, I wish you'd go through my dresser and look over my socks. I think some of them need mending. Oh, that's what I like about you, Bill. You're so romantic. this room alive. Oh, uh, I married you the greatest detective in the whole world and he'll track you down to the ends of the earth. You don't mean Bill Reardon. Oh, oh Bill. Yeah, I'm never so glad to see anybody in my whole life. Lucky for you I was here. That fellow would have plugged you. Ooh, you, my legs are shaking. I was really scared. I'm glad you had that much sense. What are you doing here in Mrs. Fraser's apartment? Same thing you are, looking for clues. Sally, you're starting to get silly. Why don't you go home and mend those socks I told you about? There's Might as well do our searching to together. If you find a clue, you tell me, and if I find a clue... I know. I... If you find a clue, you tell the newspapers. Well, why don't you answer it? You're crazy. All right, I'll answer hey, it. Hey, let go of my wrist. You nitwit. I think you would have answered it. Well, it might be a clue. Now, we'll never know who was calling. That's right. Now, whoever was calling thinks this apartment is empty. I've got a hunch that's why the call was made. Oh, I never thought of that, Bill. Sure. Now, from now on, every time I hear a phone ring, that's the first thing I'll suspect. You talk too much. Oh, this is Mrs. Frazier's dresser, all right. Look. Look, Bill. The stockings aren't any better than mine. Are you searching or are you sightseeing? <gasps> Look at that perfume. Isn't it lovely? That's yeah, lovely. Mmm. That's the kind she wears, all right. I wonder what it is. Embarrassment number five. Oh, uh, buy some for me for my birthday, will you, Bill? It's only $25 an ounce. Will you stop drenching yourself in that perfume, you little thief? All right. Hey, where are you going? Going back in the living room. Well, I'll stay here. I'm going to take a crack at that wall safe. I'll bet there's a lot of clues in it. Suit yourself. Take a crack at the wall safe. You have Three, a roll. Three, six, nine, you seven, have a roll for four, the wall safe. I thought it was a wall safe. A radio. I almost feel sorry for Marlowe having, having to work for him. Well, anybody can make a mistake. Not as many mistakes as you make, I promise. What's that? He's trying to get in. Not that light switch. Yes, I get back these curtains. Come on. Hi. Hello? Good evening. Oh, why, it's Miss Calhoun. I, I, oh, what's that letter you got in your hand? You just took it out of the drawer, didn't you? That 
That's what you came here for, isn't it? What are you doing here? Now, don't try to change the subject, Mrs. Calhoun. Give me that letter. That's my letter. You can get that. That's mine now. Sally, Sally, come I'll back here. I'll be seeing you. Hey, I'm Sally. I've got to have that letter. I'll, I'll get go- the letter later, Miss Calhoun. Sit down. Why don't you tell me all about it? You wouldn't believe me anyway. Maybe not, but I'll tell you what I believe now, that you wrote Walter Frazier a blackmailing letter. Blackmail. Yes, blackmail, and when he wouldn't be blackmailed, you killed him. No, no, no. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Well, make it the truth, because I'll find out pretty soon, honey. I was desperate. I'd lost $2,000 in roulette. Roulette where? Shane's place, across the river. I gave him a bad check for it. I was going to ask Jerry Marlowe for the money, but I couldn't. Why not? You're engaged to him. Well, I didn't want him to think I was marrying him for his money. So I, I wrote Walter and asked him for old time's sake to lend me... And he did? If that was all, why'd you take your life in your hands to steal in here? Because I thought Lola might find the letter. I didn't want Jerry to know. Can't you understand? Are you sure, sure Jerry doesn't know and suspect the worst? You're just trying to trap me and say that Jerry killed him. He didn't. If anybody did, it was Lola. She was jealous. I... Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Yes, you do. I'm sorry, Miss Calhoun, but I'll have to arrest you. You can't. You have nothing to arrest me for. Have you got a permit to carry this gun in your purse? No. Then I can hold you in the Sullivan Act. Please, Mr. That's better, Reed. isn't it, Miss Calhoun, than suspicion of murder? Right apartment? Miss Lola Frazier, please. Just tell her operator number seven is calling. <laughs> oh, hello. 376? I'd like to make an appointment to see you. Well, I've come across a letter that I feel sure will interest you. Nine o'clock is fine. It's your apartment? Thank you. 376. <laughs> I'll be there. Trenton. Yeah, Bill. I had a dictograph put into Mrs. Frazier's apartment early this morning. Well, She's I talking didn't. to somebody right now. Now, listen. All right. There it is. Well, why don't you go? Because mm-hmm. you haven't decided when I get See? to get How's that? Yeah, a little higher. higher. All right. There we are. The question is, will you pay me then? You know I'll pay you. Well, I'm that sure I'll is? get my money. I haven't decided that either. The policeman found out Good. that your husband was writing out checks to Ann Calhoun and that you knew about it. Yes, I did. They might go so far as to suspect you. I've got a hunch. If they ever found out that I knew you and that I left you to marry Ooh. Walter, they might even suspect you. I know that voice. Because even if you say hello to her, that dame thinks she has a clue. The wrong clue, but a clue. You better go out like the back way. She might recognize you. Okay. So long, little one. I wish I could place that voice. Now do I. Wherever he is, certainly knows my wife. And I think I know. Hey, what's must be the telephone? Uh, good evening, Mrs. Frazier. Oh, there she is. Yeah, for her. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, a letter from Al, uh, Ann Calhoun to your husband. Al Calhoun. I found out that I'm ashamed now. I haven't suspected that. I want to forget all that. It's a letter begging your husband for money, but between the lines, it's really very threatening. Look, it's practically blackmailing. Now, of course, if you have to know how to read it, if it means not finding the murderer, I'd rather not do that than have anything cheap come out about Walter. Oh, you have a right to feel that way, but... Well, read it for yourself. I don't care to read it, Mrs. Reardon, but I do care to do this. What's that? You've no right to destroy that letter, Mrs. Frazier. Sorry, Mrs. Reardon, but I won't have any slurs on my husband's memory. Don't you want your husband avenged? Yes, I do want Walter avenged. But I don't want his name dragged in the mud. It just means I've got to find another clue, that's all. But don't you worry, Mrs. Frazier, I get one every minute. She gets Thank one every minute. Why are I'll fire you? Oh, I knew you'd have one. I felt sure you'd. If now, I tell you, will you promise never to reveal where you heard? Why, 376, you can trust me. Well, when I went to that phone over there, just before the shot was fired that night, I heard someone on the line. Did you get there? Yeah. Wrong number? Oh, no, no, no. Somebody was talking in this apartment on the extension phone. Someone was talking on the phone. Oh. You mean in this apartment? Yes. But there was nobody in here except you, four, and the butler. Oh, the yeah. butler, I knew. Yeah, it was the butler. the butler all the time. It wasn't the butler. I know his voice. Well, then who was it? I I don't know. Oh. But I do know who he was talking to, and I do know what he was talking about. He was... Wait a minute. That wire doesn't belong under those drapes, does it? What wire? Oh, oh I oh. know you don't think I'm a, much of a detective, That's but up. I am, Mrs. Frazier. And that's a dictaphone. Somebody's been listening got to it. you. The district attorney's office, Yes, probably. the district attorney's Look, I'll just office. Yes, it all rip it here. Oh, here you, Bill. There it goes. Well, what do you know about that? Just as we were about to find out who it was that talked on that, yeah. yeah. Your wife is either the smartest woman or the biggest fool in America. She could be both. In fact, I think she is both. We know there was a man in your apartment earlier this evening. I suppose it was that victim. Never mind, we heard him. Who was he? You might as well tell us. 
It was Shane. Nick, Nick Shane. Shane, that's who it was. What was he there for? I... I... He wanted $50,000. What for? I owed it to him. You owed it to him. What for? I... I lost the money playing roulette. Quite a sum to lose gambling, isn't it? Now, did you ever play roulette? Oh, yes, for dimes. We weren't playing for dimes. I see. He promised to give me time to pay, but when... When this happened, he... He started pressing me. I... I didn't give him the money. I didn't have it. Not yet. Shane seems to have done all right in that joint of his. Did you know that Ann Calhoun had lost money there, Mrs. Fraser? Oh, yes, we'd been there together a couple of times, and we both lost. And you knew Shane before you married Fraser? Yes, a long time ago, when I was a showgirl in Chicago. That's right. I thought I'd left all that behind me when I started to marry Walter. Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Fraser. <laughs> You've told us all we want to know. I just... I didn't know. You can go now, Mrs. Fraser. And you won't be disturbed again, I promise. Thank you. Thank you. It's all right. Well, that seems to let her out. Whom do you suspect now? How about Shane? He keeps turning up in this oh, case. Shane is a gambler who uses strong arm methods to collect. They all do, but I don't see Just Shane the as the same. I'm not overlooking the fact that Frazier took his girl away from him. I wish somebody'd do the same for me. You want to see Mrs. Reardon now, Mr. Evans? Yes, I guess we'll have to. We've been grilling her for five hours. A reel going over. The works. And we can't get a thing out of her. Good morning. Isn't it a lovely day? Listen, honey, I want you to realize how serious this is. Oh, gosh, Bill, I love you. A man has been murdered. The killer must be found. Now, do you understand that? Well, if you just let me out, I could do This is a matter for the police. If you work with them, if you work with them, I promise to take another crack at the private detective business. How's that? Well, cross your heart? Well, I hadn't expected to promise as strong as that. But all right, cross my heart. Now then, what did Mrs. Fraser tell you after you ripped out that dictaphone? Well, Lola told me that a few minutes before the shot was fired, yeah. she picked up the phone and a man somewhere in her apartment was talking to the district attorney. The DA? Yeah, about gambling. Shane. Of course. I told that fathead boss of yours so at the very beginning, but he wouldn't listen. Uh, oh, uh, hello, Mr. Evans. Hello. <laughs> well, Mr. Evans, there you are. Lola Fraser heard your conversation with Shane. She did, huh? And she heard it on the Marlowe telephone. But you checked their phone. No calls came out of There's there. There's no record of one. I don't know where Shane phoned from or how the wires got crossed, but that call to you was planned in advance as an alibi, and that means that Shane is the murderer. You see? I certainly do. Now, can I go now? Certainly not. You're going back to jail. Oh, I don't want to. Well, we're going to keep you locked up before you get another clue, honey. I like this one, and I don't want it spoiled. Arrest Nick Shane wanted for murder. Calling all cars. Arrest Nick Shane wanted for murder. Forty years. Dark complexion. Slight build. Armed and desperate. Take no chances. Calling all cars. Calling all cars. I've got to get out of here. I phoned my lawyer. Why doesn't he do something? Sometimes your lawyer can't get here right away, dearie. I've been here in this jail four months waiting for my lawyer. But I've got a job to do. I'll beat them on this case if I have to burn for it. The nerve putting me in jail so he can solve the case on my clue. What are you in for, dearie? For a murder. That I'm going to commit. Hello, this is Bill Reardon. Give me the DA's private wire. Hello? Hello, Mr. Evans. Listen, I busted the Fraser murder wide open. I think I've got the whole case geared. And I'll bet you can't guess where I'm phoning from. No, I can't. I'm in Shane's apartment, and I found a phone extension. That's very interesting. Yeah? You'd better get home. Shane was just found stabbed to death in your apartment. In my apartment? Why? Where's Sally? Where's my wife? The police are holding her. She's in your apartment, too. Well, it looks tough, Mrs. Reardon. You sell me down at the jail tells them you said you'd get someone or other if you had to burn for it. She always just kidding, officer. Well, there's no way to kid. Who? Say... Is all that perfume on you? No, it was on Shane. The place was just reeking with it when I came in. I'll say it was reeking. Where are you going? Gee, I'm awful weak in my knees. All right, so you're awfully weak in your knees. Well, there's some smelling salts in the bathroom. I can go in alone, can't I? Well, I guess so. I... You guess so? Hey, hey there, you can't do that. I'm going to break down the door, lady. I tell you, I'm going to break down the door. All right, lady. I'll teach you to break down. Quick. What do you know? Hey, lady, come back here. You'll break your neck on that water pipe. Lady! Lady! Hello, Mrs. Frazier. Why did you kill Nick Shane? What? Oh, you're crazy. Oh, you don't seem very surprised that he's dead. Well, I'm not, as a matter of fact. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? You aren't surprised. Well, people were afraid of him and hated him. Well, I'm coming in. You heard him hate him, too, didn't you, Mrs. Frazier? Well, yes, I did, but I didn't kill him. Maybe not, but uh, did you ever see this handkerchief before? Where did you get that? 
I'm sorry, Mrs. Fraser. I found it beside his body. All right. I killed him. I'm not afraid now. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of. Can I use the phone? Yes. Thanks. Oh, don't worry. We'll plead the unwritten law. Say, what is the unwritten law? Darling, are you sure you're all right? Of course, here's a confession. Did you sign this, Mrs. Fraser? I did. Sally, how on earth oh, did you... Oh, she came ever... up to my apartment to see me with no intention of killing anybody. She was uh, minding her own business, but this man, Shane, followed her and made a row just because she told me he was guilty. Then he pulled a knife on her. One word led to another, and there you are. It's all in the confession. Oh, let's go. I'm ready. Ready for what? For the truth? Oh, Bill, darling, I just told you. I know you. you just told me. Now I'll tell oh. you. Walter Frazier wanted a divorce. His lawyer will swear to that. Mrs. Frazier wasn't satisfied with the settlement he offered, much less than a widow would receive. Mrs. Frazier, you offered Shane $50,000 to kill your husband. That was a gambling Yes. Game. The books show that you never lost more than $200 at roulette. Shane shot your husband standing on the window ledge outside your library. Shot him in the back while you were talking to him. The others were in the kitchen. Two days ago, Shane started pressing you for the money, threatening you. You began to realize the 50000 had only be the beginning. You killed Nick Shane deliberately. It was premeditated no, murder. No, 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 no. He had a knife. He found out somehow that I told him about the phone call. His alibi. I had to kill him. All right, take her out, Fogarty. Take her out. Come along now. Come along now. What a client. Congratulations. And now, Mrs. Reardon, if you don't mind telling me, how did you ever suspect her? Come on, let's have it, Sally. Well, when I got home, the apartment was still full of her perfume, and then when I accused her and she didn't ask any questions, you know, how it was killed or when, well, I just knew she'd done it. And you got a confession out of her with no more to go on than that? Well, I pretended I'd found her handkerchief beside the body. Where did you find it? In her purse. I resign. From now on, Mr. Evans, I'm her office boy. <laughs> What is it? The inside story of the Fraser case, or a secret of a girl detective. Who wrote it? Me. I did. What for? For five hundred dollars. We're going to put it on the radio. Give it here. Oh, you're tearing it up. I certainly am. All right. What's five hundred dollars to us anyway? Five hundred dollars, no matter who says it. But Sally. Oh, but Bill, I wasn't going to give them any real inside dope. Sally, I'm crazy about you, but there's one thing that bothers me. If you're ever found murdered. There'll never be anyone to prove that I didn't do it. You've been You're listening to Orson Welles in the Campbell Playhouse presentation of There's Always a Woman with Marie Wilson. In a moment, Arson Wells and his guests will be back with us. Meanwhile, I'd like to say this. Our play tonight told the story of a woman who helped her husband to success. Sally Reardon's methods of doing this were not exactly conventional. Still, in the end, things turned out all right. But seriously, helping a husband to success, isn't this what every good wife is doing every day? Inspiring and encouraging him, keeping him well and well-fed? Now, I'm sure that you, among the wives listening tonight, realize that the success of the work your husband does can be influenced by the kind of meals you serve him. And in these meals, you realize, too, the importance of good soup. Particularly, a soup as hearty and nourishing as Campbell's vegetable soup. As Campbell's make it, it's always a special favorite with men. They like the rich, rugged beef stock, thick with a variety of tender garden vegetables. Have you tried it at your house? If not, won't you get some tomorrow and serve it? If you'll do that and compare its fine flavor and hearty substance with the best vegetable soup ever ladled from a home soup kettle, I do believe Campbell's vegetable soup will make its appearance regularly on your family table. And now I see Orson Welles as we turn to his microphone. Mr. Welles. It gives me great pleasure to present our guest of the evening, Miss Mary Wilson. Thank you, Orson Welles. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mary Wilson, as you all know, ladies and gentlemen, has been making a series of highly successful personal appearances throughout the country. And from this tour of hers, one remarkable phenomenon has emerged. Wherever Mary Wilson has been, reporters and columnists have been fighting with each other to be the first to record those weird confusions of thought and language that are rapidly becoming known as Wilsonisms. Are you yawning, Miss Wilson? Mm-hmm. Why don't you put your hand over your mouth? Yeah, and get bit. That's the kind of thing I mean. Let me assure you, though, that despite these flagrant misrepresentations of her trenchant observations on life and letters, Miss Wilson's sole and single concern remains the eternal art of histrionics. 
Oh, now you're going too far, Orson Welles. <laughs> I never did care for history. I'm an actress. Indeed you are, Mary Wilson. And a very beautiful and charming one. We hope you'll be with us again soon. And now, as to next Sunday night. Next Sunday night, ladies and gentlemen, is Christmas Eve. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her first son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord appeared before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Since the days of Caesar Augustus, all people have celebrated by joy the great joy which shall be to all people. For unto us was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And on this day at least in the calendar of our year, we affirm the glory of our God by the laughter of our children. Every nation, according to its character and its taste, by some gift of gaiety has enriched the tradition of this, our solemnest festival. And because America is what it is, we are the fortunate heirs of the accumulated customs of almost 2,000 years of keeping Christmas. The best songs that have been sung are sung by us. The best games that have been played we play, and the best stories ever told are ours to tell. For storytelling has persisted as a Christmas ritual in spite of the printing press. A ceremony as hilarious and as serious as hanging the stocking, dressing the tree, and kissing under the mistletoe. And because Christmas is first of all for children, Christmas stories are fairy stories first of all. It's mildly surprising that the best of them all, which we're telling again for you, to, for you next week, is for everybody and turns out to be a ghost story. I've endeavored, writes this author on its title page, I have endeavored in this ghostly little story to raise the ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their hours and houses pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. It is signed, your faithful friend and servant, Charles Dickens. And Charles Dickens... As everybody but our newest friends will know, is the author of next week's story. And our star, as all our old friends will know too, is that best loved of American actors and the special favorite of all of us on the Campbell Playhouse, Mr. Lionel Barrymore, who will be keeping an engagement with us on that night that he has kept for a number of years. An engagement to play Scrooge in that most human and heartwarming of Christmas stories, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. This will be the fifth Christmas that Campbells have chosen this good old tale as their Christmas present to their friends. But I think that this year, perhaps more than ever, it becomes clear how direct 
and how all-important is the message that Charles Dickens gave the world in that little story. Wherever, anywhere in the world, people pause next Sunday night to listen to Lionel Barrymore in A Christmas Carol, there will be people a little kinder, a little happier, a little more at peace with themselves and their neighbors. So until then, until a Christmas carol with Lionel Barrymore, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us here in the Campbell Playhouse remain, as always, obediently yours. of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us in the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you our fifth annual presentation of Charles Dickens' immortal story, A Christmas Carol, starring Lionel Barrymore in his favorite role as Ebenezer Scrooge. In the meantime, if you have enjoyed tonight's Playhouse presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's vegetable soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.